Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakyan. So excited to be talking about post-quantum IoT security. We have Paul Clayson joining us on the show. Hello. Hello. Thanks for coming on, Paul. Really appreciate nice it. Nice to be here. I'm super excited for this. Big shout out to Steve Waite for introducing us. Yeah, great guy. Great guy. And I'm so pumped. This topic is really important as we move into the IoT era and into the security side of that and also into quantum computing. For those that don't know Paul's background, he's CEO of Agile PQ, which developed IoT security that survives in a quantum computing era. And you can find the link in the bio below, agilepq.com, as well as his LinkedIn profile. Paul, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions to ask our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? Direction of our world. You know, uh, I guess I could uh, use the term, it's the best of times and the worst of times. <clears throat> so you have all of this technology that is going to help humanity, everything, uh, all kinds of things in energy, uh, in sensors that can be able to help our world in so many directions, but it's also used by bad actors that uh, can use those kinds of things for clandestine purposes. We've got the best of times when prosperity is amazing, where people have uh, money and, and um, food and happiness in a lot of ways, but there are still so many tragic situations around the world, uh, everything from vast, still vast hunger in some places to um, children who are at risk to human trafficking to all kinds of things that we are grappling with in this world. And it seems like there are times when uh, the faster we go to create good situations in the world, uh, the faster that uh, a negative aspect grows as well. So we've got a lot of work to do, but there's a lot of hope in this world. Yeah, that's actually a frequently reoccurring uh, point from people on the show is it's the best of times and in some crazy ways, the worst of times. and so how do we win this wisdom race where we have all these democratization of all these exponential technologies, but we also have to level up our wisdom, our ability to maximize prosperity, to know how to play well together. Um, and so what would be maybe a core principle that you would recommend people to embody as we move forward? Well, uh, look, I believe in humanity. I believe that humans are ultimately innately good and if they perpetrate bad acts, it's because likely they were taught those bad acts in some way along their life. So the perpetuation of education, the perpetuation of ethics, the perpetuation of goodness uh, in the world is absolutely critical from the time that a baby is born. Yeah. And if we can instill those kinds of um, feelings and um, uh, in human beings right from the start, then life gets much better. It's just that there are so many disadvantaged um, <clears throat> civilizations and disadvantaged cultures that, that start out life in a very uh, difficult situation and oftentimes it can lead to uh, difficult circumstances uh, within the world. Yeah, this is so critical, this moment as the child's born into the world, there's so much that comes from it ancestrally and then also those first key months as it's laying down its first inputs that it takes in to have enough love and compassion, food, water, air, shelter, the basic needs, electricity, education, then that's, that's the thing is that it's taught bad. Malevolence is taught. And so if there is a way to, to propagate more education around goodness and around um, ethics and morality, these types of things, then we can figure out how to cooperate and prosper more effectively. I like that a lot. Paul, let's talk about your journey. Who were you growing up? How did you get interested in the fields that you're in today? Yeah, so growing up, I grew up on a very small uh, farm and cattle ranch in Idaho. Um, I was an adopted child, adopted when I was three days old, and, uh, uh, wow. and grew, grew up with an, an older brother and two younger sisters who were adopted. Uh, my mother could not have uh, children biologically. Uh, but boy, you would never know it in our household. We had more love, more nurturing, more help, more um, strength uh, in our home than you can ever imagine. We were as poor as we could be on the small farm. I didn't know that. Um, it was an amazing, amazing childhood. And I grew up just knowing 
ethics and knowing goodness and knowing to be good to other people and uh, being um, awakened in the middle of the night by my father and saying, come on, uh, our neighbor's uh, barn is burning. We're going down to help uh, put the fire out and keep, keep the embers from going to his haystacks and his home and other buildings. And so we, we grew up being neighbors. We grew up helping people. And uh, what an amazing, amazing yeah. uh, upbringing I had. It was, uh, I couldn't have had a better uh, upbringing. It was, it was truly amazing. And just as an interesting side note, I never did know uh, birth family until one year ago right now. And I took a DNA test, and uh, when I got the results back, uh, it's a long story, but uh, I was reading the, I, I took the test for a medical profile and uh, got the medical profile back and was reading that and I, I was on a business trip and my wife said, are, are there any birth relatives? It hadn't occurred to me to look. Mm. I was just reading the medical profile mm -hmm. and I looked and there was a birth sister and two birth brothers Whoa. listed there, half brothers and half sisters. And, uh, and through that experience, without going into all of the long uh, details, within 30 days I had met uh, flown, to, uh, met online, then spoken with on the phone, and then flew to meet um, birth family on both my father and my mother's side. And uh, my birth father had passed away, but my birth mother is still living. She Whoa. lives in uh, Olympia, Washington, and I've met her now and seen her many times. And uh, I thought the question, the first question she ever asked me when she got on the phone with Why? me was this. Why? She said, have you had a good life? Are you okay? I've worried every day of my life that I gave you away and it wasn't the right thing to do. And I was able to assure this beautiful woman that she, for whatever reason, couldn't, if she couldn't raise me, that she did an amazing thing for me because I had such an incredible, impeccable uh, early years in my life. So that's the early stage. Paul, that's such an interesting story. So when you grew up, it was on rural Mississippi? Uh, Idaho. Idaho, rural Idaho. Okay, rural Idaho. And you had a birth, you had an, an, another adopted brother and sister? Two sisters and a brother, yes. Two sisters and a brother. So you have four total adopted children in this, in this in family. In this family. Wow. Yeah. And then, wow, and from three days old. From, from three, days old, three days old when I was adopted. In Idaho. Yeah. And so then as you're growing up with them, you said that you were given, you know, you all love and all, what you needed from the, from the adoption, from the parents that adopted yeah. you. And then it was like hard for, uh, for people to see or it didn't really feel like it was an adopted family. It felt like it oh. was a biological family. That's so, that's like, that's when I think the, like, so important because then that, then the adoption like feels like it's you know really I recall in an instance when I was in grade school when uh, just as children sometimes naturally do but they were really giving me a bad time because uh, everyone knew that I was adopted in this small farming community and I never knew a time when I didn't know that I was adopted but but to me this was my family and my uh, my mother and my father but uh, some some you know, out on the playground, some kids were giving me a bad time about being adopted and that I was found on the side of the road and all the kinds of things that they can do. And I came in in the second grade and my second grade teacher looked at me and she said, are you okay? And I burst out in tears because I, I didn't know how to handle that. And she knelt down by me and asked me what was wrong and I told her what had been said and she stood up and I'll never forget her telling the whole class, you guys have no idea what his parents had to go through to get him and they love him as much as any parent would love their own child. And it was a great learning experience for the entire class. And it's, it absolutely solidified in me that I'm okay. Yeah. I'm just fine. That things happen in life, but how you build those and, and surmount those difficulties means everything. Yeah, yeah, and how you have an, a, a mentor or a teacher that can help. Helps you along the way. Helps you along the way and help the whole class learn that along yeah, the way. Yeah, of course. Um, those are pivotal moments. It almost, it helped you with your, with who you were true, truly, with embodying who you were and rather than needing to like bury it aside to fit in or whatever. Yeah. That's so important. And then also it's interesting that your biological mother um, said that that she worried about you every day and that, that you, if you were okay and had a successful life, all that type of things. Um, 
and that you just recently found that out through DNA testing. You know, there's very interesting things that science is um, able to uh, unveil for us, and that's well, that's one of them is yeah. this ancestry. So then, what about your interest in science and technology and the fields that led you to Agile PQ? How did all these things develop? Who were you? Well, I spent a period of time coming out of college uh, involved in politics. Um, I ran a congressional campaign and went to Washington. I was chief of staff to two congressmen in Washington and uh, worked uh, for the White House uh, doing what's called advance work, setting up details when they would travel and, and taking them through the, the events as they would travel and so forth. I was not uh, involved in policy at the White House, but I learned an awful lot about that. And I've remained active in politics ever since, uh, uh, working on campaigns, being campaign chairman of people who have run for Senate and the House and governor and various other things and sat on presidential campaign committees. Um, that's been an active part of my life. But through all of that, I, after I left Washington, D.C., I wanted to get uh, into business and I went into the investment business. And uh, I learned corporate finance and business uh, being in, involved uh, in that. Then I wanted to move to the operating side and a, and a friend, a very dear friend, a wonderful man, um, had started a technology company in speech recognition software. And he invited me to come and join him in his company uh, as a vice president. And I did that and uh, started running around the world trying to look for a variety of development contracts for that speech recognition. And then since then, um, I've had the opportunity to go into different kinds of really leading edge technologies and started serving as a CEO and growing these companies and uh, putting money behind them, putting people behind them, and growing these leading edge technologies. And it's been, uh, it's been a journey because it hasn't been only in software. It's been in software, nanotechnology, solar energy, um, a variety of different uh, uh, industries. And it's been, a, it's been a real ride. It's been a lot of fun uh, taking those companies, growing them, getting them to the next stage, and, and uh, moving forward. Yeah, very multidisciplinary, polymathic, tons of different fields of science and technology, especially politics too in DC too, kind of learning about how that works. Yeah. The, these different, these are like different engines of change and to know how they work makes you more well-rounded. Um, and also it grows your emotional intelligence skills because you have to learn how to relate to people in the political sphere, in growing companies, investing in companies that are trying to make different impacts. So then what about, what led to the Agile BQ? Uh, well, I had been working in a company uh, that I had um, uh, grown and it was uh, getting to a, a larger point. We hired a new CEO who had a PhD in nanotechnology. And, uh, and then I started doing some consulting for investors who would say, could you come into this company and help um, get it commercial or in a couple of cases turn it around or find a workout for uh, a company. So I did that uh, for a while and then a friend invited me to look at this company. Um, he had had a 35 year career at Intel, had been contacted by Agile PQ to see if they could find some markets and do some things. Um, really good group of people who had founded uh, Agile PQ. Um, but I think the timing was right for maybe the board and the, invest and, and the early investors who were more family investors, angels, uh, family and friends, to maybe look to someone who had been there and done that before, helped to bring the company to the next phase of, of uh, pulling it into commercial uh, launch. So I, uh, I, I went in at first and did some consulting, provided a report, and very shortly thereafter they asked me to step in as CEO and then I really looked at the markets very strongly, very much in depth and I decided to do it. This is a phenomenal technology, phenomenal opportunity. The, the timing is right. Uh, it's it's a, a great opportunity. So I stepped in a couple of years ago and we launched the product uh, a year ago uh, now and uh, got a, our handful of beta customers last year and now we're in full commercial launch and, and doing well. Whoa, okay, so then what did you guys release that last year and where is this being deployed? Teach us about it. So we released a, a technology that is a full security encryption technology with a total footprint of two kilobytes. 
So that means that total encryption security can reside on uh, the smallest of what are called IoT devices, Internet of Things. These are very small computing devices connected to the Internet, and mostly they are machine-to-machine -machine communication. Mm -hmm. So it's a very small device communicating with the server, uh, collecting data. Sometimes it can be as small as an off-on switch. Sometimes it can be a thermostat on a wall that you run from your smartphone. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes it can be a sensor that's sensing uh, something on a manufacturing floor, whether that be vibration of a motor, heat, um, light, any, all kinds of, uh, of sensors. They are now are connected to the internet, which provides massive amounts of data and allows for uh, a greater quality of products, um, greater security in some cases. Uh, but those very small devices are so small that they cannot run traditional security. There's not enough computing power, not enough memory, and in fact, some of them have a total of 100 kilobytes in processing power on those very small devices. Well, today's encryption that's run on your smartphone, that encryption takes three megabytes mm -hmm. to encode and three megabytes to decode a, a message going in and out. That can't operate on, a, on these small, mm -hmm. what are called class zero, class one, class two devices. So our company came along and very bright engineers created a new security for a new computing age. Mm -hmm. And that new security is more secure than that legacy technology, which is called AES TLS, Advanced mm -hmm. Encryption Standard, transport layer system, um, AES TLS technology. It's more secure. It's up to 10 times faster. It uh, uses far less battery power. Um, it, it's just a phenomenal uh, revolutionary change in uh, encryption and security technology. Whoa, all right, so let's break down some of the nuance. So then you have, it's a, so it's software. It's, it, it's packaged in two kilobytes is the size Correct. of the software. And then, then that goes on IoT devices. It does. And the IoT devices have a classification in terms of size, like yes. class zero is smallest? The smallest. And what's the largest class size? Oh, you know? I don't even know, but a, a, a smartphone is roughly a class three, sometimes a class four device. Okay, so got it. So three or four is on smartphone level. So class zero is like, um, is, is like we're talking grain of rice, Oh. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very small uh, chipset, less than a hundred kilobytes in processing, very little memory. So it would be, it would be analogous to a chipset that's say on a Nest thermostat on your wall. Okay. So then something, let's say that the chipset in a Nest thermostat or the chipset in any of the um, other sensing sensors in, like you were describing earlier, in the factories for machines. Um, that are constantly up watching machines or um, any camera sensors on maybe autonomous vehicles or wherever, right? We want to make sure that what information that camera is seeing when it's looking at the road is then move, as the data is being transmitted to the server and being in, which is potentially, you know, just c cloud computing the what, the what the camera is seeing and then making decisions in millisecond time frames that Correct. you need to then run that data, that camera sensing data through your encryption, which only takes two kilobytes, your encryption, you're encrypting it, then you, you're sending it to the uh, server for, which needs to then decrypt it to run the computation? Yeah, so, yeah, so you that. use a key, uh, you, in essence, obfuscate the data, you scramble it, send the message in an encrypted form, then there's a key on the back end that will decode the message, it's received by the server, and then it can uh, continue to send messages uh, back and forth. What those small devices are lacking today is that kind of encryption, uh, full encryption on a very small device. There are some technologies that people believe are security, like a simple authentication and authorization. The server says to an IoT device, is, are you the right device? The IoT device says, yep, that's me, and then it authorizes a data stream to go back and forth. That's called um, uh, authorization and authentication and authorization. Sometimes small IoT devices will have that. 
Sometimes they don't. The vast majority of the billions of IoT devices that are already deployed across the world have zero, tech, zero security on them, no security on them whatsoever. So if you've got a, a smart thermostat, in some cases smart doorbells, in some cases smart consumer goods, or in, uh, sensors on a factory floor, or um, all, all kinds of IoT devices, they just simply don't have security. And in some cases, there's just a lack of education about why that's even important. Yeah. People say, well, it's only this amount of data. Why would we ever worry about that? There's a massive number of reasons why people uh, can be tremendously exposed and the corporate risk that goes up uh, by having an exposed computing device connected to the internet. Yes, okay, so then the actual process of securing these uh, data streams is extremely important. And then also that um, you call this SLIM, secure last internet mile. And then that's also for both the last internet mile, but also it's SLIM as in the actual tech is two kilobytes. So yeah, that's yeah. the idea. It's like, yeah. yeah. Secure, uh, secure last IoT mile. IoT yeah. mile. Although yeah. in today's world, these devices are so small, we sometimes joke that it's really not no longer an IoT mile, it's an IoT inch. Uh, yeah, that's right. I mean, these, these devices are so small and they're, they're so constrained uh, uh, on computing power and battery power and various other things, yeah. Okay, so the constraining aspects of these class zero, class one IoT devices, they're super small, the chipset, it's not really able to take on a, a whole lot of processing uh, capacities on board itself. So it's, it's really, um, trying to just take in the data that it's having and then encrypting it with that key and then giving it to the server which has the other side of the key to be able to decrypt it. Yes. And does that key change? Oh yes. The key changes every, how often does it change? Well this is an interesting thing. So in an AES, a standard legacy security type system, uh, they, they, they create a key at the beginning of a message, a key at the end of the message. And um, those keys rotate or change through a variety of messages so that even if somebody were to break one message, it, they would have to break uh, the code again to get to the next message. That's what's made encryption uh, quite secure over the years. However, with our technology, we, we uh, use a much larger key. Now that doesn't seem intuitive. If we have a much smaller footprint, how do you have a bigger key? Well, we reduced the size of the operating code dramatically from three megabytes down to two kilobytes. And that allows us to have two kilobytes of operating code plus a much longer key. That makes us far more secure in terms of that key, number one. Those keys, our keys are long enough that they won't be able to be broken by a quantum computer in the future as quantum computing age begins to uh, become reality here. Um, it's pretty much well accepted that current encryption technology will be broken by quantum computers. Ours will not, f and that's one reason. The second thing is, is current technology uses a key at the beginning of a, a message, a key at the end. We break that message up into much smaller byte sizes and put a key at the beginning of e and end of each byte, not at the beginning and end of each message and we rotate those keys continually. That also gives us a distinct advantage in a quantum computing environment. So, so this becomes uh, some things that we do that are strong competitive advantages that are built into our algorithms that allow us to operate and will protect people as quantum computing uh, becomes pervasive. Okay. And one more time on the two important pieces that enable you to... So, size of the security key. Size of the key. Yep. Okay. And both the size of the message that's being transmitted and where the keys are placed in those messages and how often they're rotated. How often the keys are rotating and how often they're placed in the messages. Yes. And how long each key is. Yes. Okay, and so that's kind of some of the proprietary It stuff. is, how we do that and what we do and size of keys and how we do that uh, with, great, uh, with great agility 
and, uh, and, and okay. great speed is part of our, our uh, proprietary technology. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's always interesting thinking about on a technical side how computer scientists and encryption specialists are figuring this stuff out. And how yeah. They, yeah. It's sophisticated technology, but um, things are happening, communications are happening so fast. I mean, the things are going back and forth so fast. But in the future, they're going to get faster. And they ha we have to be able to communicate securely and have to be able to communicate with great speed in the future to keep up with technology. I can tell you, bad actors are figuring this out as fast as the white hat actors are. Um, we have a, a young man on our staff who's just a, an absolutely brilliant cryptologist. He's one of the four best hackers, white hat hackers in the world. And, um, and he stresses all the, all the time how critical it is that we come up with new ways, new methods, and new standards to have uh, security systems for this IoT uh, freight train. It's an interesting fact that in 2018, the number of these small IoT devices surpassed the number of other computing form factors uh, com uh, combined throughout the world. So all of the smartphones, laptops, uh, wow. desktop servers, IoT devices now make up more computers than all of those in the world. And IoT only really started in earnest about five years ago. So the technology adoption has been just vast. Well, we're not keeping up to the computing growth with security growth and with some other factors, mm -hmm. but primarily security growth to fit those form factors. Yeah. And so we're, we've done that, and now we're coming out of obscurity telling people about what we're doing. And we launched our product last year, uh, finished up our beta accounts, got everything going, and now we're in full commercial mode with our technology. And already we've been signed up to be on over 300 million devices in the next three years. 300 million, million devices, devices yeah. and there's, there's, the numbers are all over the board on IoT, but the, some people estimate that there's already somewhere between uh, 15 and 20 billion, billion devices, yeah, IoT right. devices in the world, and that's projected to go to 50 billion by 2021 uh, in, some, in some projections. Yeah. Uh, some go higher than that, some are lower, the projections, nobody really knows what they do know is there's going to be a lot of devices in the, within the next five years, 80% of the world's computers will be these small IoT devices. Yeah. So we better wow. get real about putting security on these things. Yeah. It's crazy that in just the last five years that IoT devices have overcome the amount of computers and cell phones that we have. That's crazy. And now that the estimates are to be in the tens of billions in the next couple of years. It's like securing those data streams, making sure that you have the top edge uh, people on board that can white hat, white hat meaning white hat hackers. They're good people hacking, so, trying to see if they can yeah. break down the. So people hire white hat hackers all the time to go in and say, hack our system. See if you can get into it and show us where our vulner vulnerabilities are because they want those hackers to be as good as the bad actors to make sure that they can find holes in the systems and plug those holes before uh, data, critical data is stolen, or in some cases money or, uh, or those kinds of things. But there are, uh, weekly there are news articles about hacks that have taken place because of holes in systems. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what a white hat hacker is. Yeah, and then it makes sense to have that on your team to constantly be seeing if, if you, what you're making, how hard it is to hack into it to continue making it better and better over time. Interesting. Now, this can be used in any protocol, RFID, Bluetooth, cellular. We, any communications protocol uh, we can use. Uh, we, we can, because of software, we have already integrated with and ported to all kinds of protocols. We've uh, prepared the technology for mass market by integrating with a, a, a large number of 
um, IoT chipsets already. We can operate in multiple languages. So we have a toolkit that uh, people can get. We have 10 free seats on that toolkit. People can get that, develop it into their product, and then sign a commercial license uh, uh, when they're ready to go to market with their technology. We, uh, we don't have to go only on new products. We can, we can flash our technology to existing IoT devices. So it, it's a pretty nimble program. Okay, and then what about, you were mentioning the speeds too. So what does it mean to be like eight to 10 times faster and to have one tenth the data? What it, yeah, what are those? Yeah, those so mean? there is a technology called transport layer system that requires a certain amount of data to connect the transport of data from point to point, from machine to machine. Mm -hmm. um, it takes a certain amount of size uh, data code and size to connect that data. Our technology uses one-tenth the data of the standard TLS. We had to create a new transport layer system for us that just kind of tunnels right through the existing transport layer and, uh, and connects in less data, uh, with less data. Because our code is so much smaller, it's efficient, uh, that lends to having a much faster processing speed. Uh, because we're uh, fast and nimble and smaller code size. We don't use nearly as much battery power. I think the projection or, or the, uh, the estimate is that about 80% of IoT devices in the future will be battery powered, not hardwired. Mm. So they're not going to have unlimited power. You don't want to run that battery down running a security system because then you're going to have to change the battery or change the device regularly. Can you, you can wirelessly charge to the device. Well, some I'm sure you can, but most of them are going to be battery. And when, when the battery runs out, they'll either change it, or in most cases, these are throwaway devices. You take the device off, put a new device on, and, and run it for another two to three years on battery power. So yeah. you just can't have encryption and security systems that run that battery down quicker because it becomes costly and it becomes uh, um, uh, difficult to replace those devices uh, too often. And then that also is the, that's both the speed and the data, both, on both that side? Yes. That explains both of those things? I'm, oh, I'm so, I'm so trying to understand this, so. <laughs> I apologize, it is rather sophisticated it is. what sophisticated. takes place. Yeah, okay, so then the speed is faster because? Because we have a very small code. We're able to process that okay. code, encode and decode, encrypt and decrypt, much, much faster. Okay. Using smaller code sizes. Okay. And then the, the data is less because it's well, the, DDs? Well, because of the way we've configured the algorithms. Okay. Uh, we came up with a new encryption system uh, that, uh, that can process that data much, much uh, more efficiently. And then what about the post-quantum side of things? So when we have that much compute, how can you withstand... Yeah, so quantum computers are on their way. Um, they're under development now and they're being used. Uh, there's quantum computers uh, in the US at NASA and various I at IBM and other places. There's quantum computers in Canada and in, uh, in China and various other uh, areas that have technological development. And a quantum computer processes data in an entirely different way than a current computer does. Our current computer uses what's called binary code, ones and zeros to do programming. A quantum computer uses a whole new programming language called qubits. In fact, it sees a one and a zero as the exact same uh, symbol. Uh, and, and we don't have time to go in how t quantum computers work, but in certain cases and, certain, and for certain functions, it can process massive amounts of data much faster, much more streamlined, and there will be huge uh, benefits to having quantum, quantum computing in the future. But it also presents problems like any new technology does. And one of the problems is it can process data so quickly that it's estimated that it can break um, current computing systems. So when we built our system, we built it with, uh, with larger keys. So let's say uh, an AES key uh, that to encode a message and to decode on the back end. 
is much smaller than ours. So a quantum computer can crunch through all of the different possibilities in those numbers to come up to crack that code of that key. They could crunch through that data so fast that they could break that. So our key space, the entire universe of possible key combinations, mm -hmm. is 429 orders of magnitude larger than the current security system. Because our keys are so much bigger, that key space um, is larger. That, that uh, it, it's mathematically we can show how that kind of a key space cannot be broken by a quantum computer. Okay, so, so it's both a compression algorithm that enables you to make these massive keys compress down, and then it's also then how difficult it is for something with that much of a key space to be able to be um, penetrated by a quantum computer. Yeah, maybe just one nuance. It's not really compression technology. It's the way we use those keys and the way the algorithm processes those. And, and, uh, the way the algorithm yeah, processes those. Yeah. So the key space has to be a certain amount of size to be secure. Uh, and so you, you don't want to compress that down with, uh, to a smaller number of, of um, symbols or a smaller number. Uh, but but it, the, the algorithm itself processes that code in a very efficient way, even though our key space is larger, our processing code is much smaller. Okay, okay. Key space, larger processing code, smaller. Yep, smaller processing code than current, larger key space than current. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah this, it's, it's a lot, to, it's stuff a lot to, to go through. With. Yeah. Well, it's, I think one of the most friendly ways of explaining, like, yeah, we get the big IoT explosion in terms of the amount of devices. Okay, it makes sense that, they're, that the way that they're transmitting the data from their sensor to the cloud or where it's being stored or computed is needs to be encrypted. We get that part. And then I think we get that it like currently on the phones, it's about three megabytes uh, in terms of how much uh, um, storage you need to um, for the software of encryption. Um, but you guys brought it down to two kilobytes and it's more sophisticated. Yeah, and it is. So then that kind of, and then the sophistication, how it's actually all that side of things, the keys and the actual, yeah. how often you put them in there, how often you change them. How, yeah, all that. lend to the security of the system. And the way we've done that, uh, the brilliance in our engineers is that the way they did that is really beneficial because it can fit on those small devices. In a nutshell, that's our business model. It's so interesting that there's like humans that are so hyper specialized that know how to do that. And then there's like, humans specialize in all of the fields, and then there's also humans that focus on like breadth of, of knowledge instead of depth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm super breadth, and so I like, whenever people go really deep, like hyper deep, like level 10 or 50 yeah. on depth on that, those fields, it's hard to keep up, so I'm trying to constantly figure out how to keep up when people talk, trying to abstract a layer up to try and explain and understand sure. is usually what I'm... Sure usually what I'm doing. And then who are some of the companies that have come on board for Agile PQ already? And yeah. So we have uh, companies and we don't, in some cases we have uh, non-disclosure agreements uh, with companies. So I'm, I'm a little careful about naming names, but I'll give you an idea on product. Some mm -hmm. of the things that are using us. So there is a, a lot of IOT devices that are started to be used in retail merchandising. So going into a retail store in the future and some now, instead of seeing a printed pricing tag where a clerk comes by and if they want to change the price of a bag of potato chips, they print out a new tag, pull the old one off, put the new one on. Includes the price, the price per unit, uh, a barcode, some other things on that tag, that pricing tag. Those are now being replaced with LCD screens. And those LCD screens the pricing can be changed in a business office. So you can change pricing. And for retail stores, oftentimes they can change pricing several times during a day. A um, couple of examples. Uh, it starts to rain and your price on umbrellas is uh, 10 bucks an umbrella, but you know you can raise that to 12 because people are going to be running in to keep their, their uh, 
their bodies dry in, in the rain so they can raise the price on those umbrellas when it starts to rain. Well, that small increase can mean a lot to profits of a retail store when they're working on very, very s slender margins. So that kind of technology can be very, very beneficial. It can reduce the number of employees who have to put um, pricing tags out and you can repurpose those employees to greet customers and show them to where they're uh, where the goods are that they're trying to buy. So an IoT sensor on every retail item and that can... There can be. That can dynamically change the price on that retail item yeah. from a code deployment rather than manual yeah. process. And it automatically changes it on that what are called ESL tag, electronic shelf labeling tags. Mm -hmm. Well those tags typically ha are class zero devices, very small computing power and no security on them. So we went to market with that and signed uh, a couple of contracts where we are now providing security on those electronic shelf labeling tags. That's one application. Another application where we've signed a customer is um, they, have, they have developed um, asset tracking devices that can track by GPS and a lot of different factors. They can track, let's say, a shipping container on a ship or a box that's going on an air freight. Um, or another very interesting application they have is uh, they've developed a really tremendous and sophisticated program, asset tracking program for police evidence going into police departments so that evidence isn't lost or misplaced or when it's moved they know where it is if it's, if it's uh, put in a wrong place. Um, those are high value assets. Yeah. And so uh, they need the data going back and forth to be secured so that people can't intercept information about where a box of high value evidence is in a criminal trial. So they need security on those kinds of things. Um, there is uh, physical security. So there's all kinds of sensors now that can increase physical security. Everything from um, from heat sensors, motion sensors, visual sensors, gunshot sensors uh, that could alert uh, a system to lock certain things down. Say in a school if there's an unfortunate incident like happened in Gilroy, they could lock certain things down so that people can't pass from area to area. Um, physical security, you don't want to be intercepted so that bad actors could either shut that off or know who's being alerted where. Um, consumer devices. There's lots and lots and lots of consumer devices now that are being connected to the internet, but they're very small computing platforms. Uh, and oftentimes, transactions are being developed on those small computing platforms and sent to a server uh, for the manufacturer of the device, but you don't want that information exposed to the world. You need to secure that data transmission. Or what about for a child's toy? If, if it's connected to the internet so that there's learning and there's all kinds of things that can happen on a child's toy, do you really want somebody to have access to your child's toy that could put up inappropriate information on a screen, could make a connection with a child somehow? Those kinds of communications need to be secured. So those are some of the kinds of things that we, uh, we are doing already. Um, smart cities, there are sensors all around cities like here in San Francisco where there might be sensors that count people as they go by or count cars or see how fast people are going or uh, um, detect uh, all kinds of weather changes, humidity changes that may affect road conditions or sidewalk conditions. Um, um, all of those kinds of things become smart cities applications. We have smart cities contracts now. Those are some of the kinds of things that we're securing the data that's being collected. Damn, yeah, that list of applications is so long already. And it's huge. It's huge, it's huge. And um, everything from, yeah, the smart cities that you're describing all the way to just knowing, um, like, just like putting a massive code deployment out to a bunch of IoT connected devices that can then instantly make a change in the environment. Yes. Um, it kind of, do you ever, do you ever 
cons do you ever concern yourself with like that that our direction is that making us more safe or is that making us you know how do you feel about that? IOT yeah well right now it doesn't necessarily make us more safe but it can make our world much much better um, just think of medical technology for one you have implantable devices implantable devices can be connected to the internet and can be monitored by a server so that if there is a medical condition that could be life-threatening uh, to someone, it can be detected very quickly. And, um, and, and medical uh, uh, help could uh, be on the way very, very quickly. That's a big one, this monitoring of biometric states for uh, predicting pathologies, that's, that's a big one. But, but what if yeah. a bad actor yeah. in a nation state, as an example, who didn't like the United States, wanted to figure out a way to hack a bunch of devices, and let's say there were 10 million devices implanted in people around the country, and they could literally either shut them off or cause malfunctions that could cause serious health problems, or in some cases, death. Yeah, predictive crime analytics is also an interesting one. It but is. It also makes it seem a little bit like Big Brother as well. It does, but I got to tell you, Alan, a while back somebody asked me, what do you think of Big Brother and don't, shouldn't, should we even be doing this? And should the United States be looking? I got to tell you, everybody else is. China is watching you. Yeah, but what, doesn't that, doesn't that kind of like get us to the point of kind of like, you know, does everyone need to be watching everyone or can we like more ethically or morally evolve ourselves. I, I don't think it's a question of whether they should be. It's a question that they are. How do you shut that off? So what, you, what we need are people with ethics and understanding and securing of data in an appropriate way to be able to better our world. Um, I don't, you, you won't be able to turn off the mass proliferation of collection of data that's going on in today's world. It's only going to grow exponentially. Yeah, there's no way that one that feels like this definitely feels like one of those impossible, but who knows you could probably we could possibly kick it off. But one person to try and take on eight billion people that are all using all the devices and the data proliferation and all that stuff. So then yeah, the companies are watching, the governments are watching to how do you do it in a way that's a, in, a, in a benevolent way instead of a malevolent way is we, a major question to ask and could we evolve ourselves spiritually so that we don't necessarily need so much oversight and need so much um, regulation on all of these things. So that's probably, that's probably the broad answer there is to create people who have a greater spiritual connection or a greater ethical connection. Um, but bad actors are always going to be there. We often joke that uh, the IoT world is amazing, but um, but there's a lot of machines that are having a lot of unprotected text yeah. uh, uh, in today's world, and we we've got to find ways to secure data in a way that it can't just be proliferated and used for clandestine purposes. So machines having unprotected text needs to be stopped because there are potentially malevolent actors. And so that by itself, it's the proliferation of machines is going to keep happening. The proliferation of data is going to keep happening. Okay. So find security methods that truly secure it. Yeah, and spiritually evolve ourselves to not need to even worry as much about malevolent actors. This, um, this is an interesting dilemma that yeah, we find it ourselves is. in. It is. It's like we're compensating for our lack of spiritual development with securing, with security, with data security and encryption and, uh, yeah. Well, um, it's the reason people in the Middle Ages built fortresses with walls that are very, very high. Yeah, that's another way to look at it. Yeah. I mean, it's been going on since probably the day the earth cooled. I mean, it's been going on where, uh, you know, the vast majority of people are just good human beings. People want to be good. They want to be ethical. They want to be good human beings. But there are those who take advantage of that goodness. And it always has been and always will be. So. We won't stop, and in my view, we shouldn't stop 
the development of technology and the proliferation of technology to better our lives, to, to, uh, to reduce hunger, to grow uh, uh, crops better, to, to uh, help monitor where children are, to help uh, monitor bad actors that seek to harm people. Those are all very good uses of technology. Um, but they, they come at a price, and that price, uh, we're, so we're constantly trying to find the medieval wall, if you will, to, to protect uh, against the, the development of these kinds of technologies. That's what we're involved in. And if we go back in time to Idaho, Paul, you know, back as a kid, you know, with family and with your neighbors and just that purity and innocence of just being, there, that world that doesn't need the massive stone walls or moats and it doesn't need all of the insane amounts of encryption and big brotherness, how does that feel? Well, um, I tell my wife all the time, let's sell our house in the city and just move out to the country. Um, and uh, I, I was respectful today. I, I didn't wear my cowboy boots, but normally I've got cowboy, <laughs> cowboy boots, boots and yeah. uh, and jeans on. And uh, you know, there there's a there's a great uh, appeal to that kind of thing, but it complicates our lives for me to be traveling a much greater distance to get to the office and all those kinds of things. So you protect your family and you do what you need to to uh, make sure that you reduce uh, stress in other ways in in your life, but. There's a great appeal to uh, living in the land and off the land, and it's and it's a beautiful lifestyle. I mean, you were born in South Dakota. You, you know, your roots go back uh, there. Um, you know, the, the founder of our company who developed the core technology lives in North Dakota and still still lives there and doesn't want to move. So he commutes in to be with us uh, periodically. Um, there is a you know, the, the, the hustle and bustle, the, the commotion that is around us can lead to a lot, of, a lot of stress and in some cases can lead to clandestine activities. Uh, we see a lot of homeless problem uh, here in San Francisco and, and all around the country in major cities and so forth. Um, there, it leads to a lot of problems. Uh, but we're not going to stop it. People congregate together for jobs and for, hopefully, for support and being with neighbors and those kinds of things, too. Yeah, the rush of the billions of people to metropolises in, that are, have yet to really graduate from spiritual kindergarten and in many ways causing, exacerbating further this disconnection from each other, this disconnection from nature, this this propagation of, of, of garbages that we have now in oceans and in landfills. And the lack of spiritual development is, just seems to be so evidently the reason why we find so much mental health issues, so much distrust in each other and having to spy on each other to secure and encrypt things. Um, it's funny, some people say that we are exactly where we're supposed to be like in terms of our origin story and creation this is exactly where we're supposed to be right now and that we're on the Tao, that we're on the path and others say that we're way the fuck off of the Tao. we're way off of the path um that the path is what we were just describing a little bit ago this 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 young paul on the farm in idaho um and just having more innocence and more purity and more spiritual development where we don't need all of the big brotherness pointed at all these different countries that are, have all evolved on the same rock. Um, where do you, how do you feel about, about that? All of that? So, I, uh, so, so you mentioned earlier the concept of, I think it was emotional intelligence or, yeah. or that, that you talked about. There are so many forms of intelligence. Well, one of those forms of intelligence is existential intelligence the intelligence of understanding the spiritual. Yeah. Um, I'm very much a believer in that. I am not a believer that we should say to children, I'm not going to help you nurture your existential intelligence or other types of intelligence in you. Mm. And you can decide as you grow up on your own 
uh, whether whether there is such a thing as a spiritual realm or or whether there is such a thing as God. Um, I am a believer that by making that decision, you decided to not have the spiritual training in a child's life. So, yes, a child can grow up and decide to to believe a different way. That's fine. That's their agency to do that. They have that personal agency to do that. Um, so not inhibiting the existential intelligence of every child that's being I born completely through. believe okay. that. They ought to be exposed to that. They ought to be taught from the time they're very small. I was, and I know I'm biased because of that, but I was taught that. And it has blessed my life, and I taught my children that. Not all of my children believe the exact same thing. They're not robots. Uh, they have their own mind. But I believe they're good ethical people. Do you believe that we come from that single source or that single origin? I believe that we are, that yes, that we, have a, that we have an origin. I believe in God. I believe we are, are children of God. I yeah. believe that there is a higher being and that, uh, and that we have a purpose in life. And, and that we're, uh, we're meant to fulfill that purpose in a, in a mortal life. I believe that life itself is the combination of an eternal spirit and a physical uh, uh, mortal body. Mm. And uh, I believe that those are very real things. And because of that eternal spiritual uh, part of us, we seek, we want to, to be connected yeah. With, with communication and, and we want to be connected with uh, the spiritual if we'll let ourselves develop our spiritual existential intelligence we can get there very much a part of my life yeah yeah it's beautiful hearing you talk about it and it's actually really important that more and more of the uh, tech and science leaders in silicon valley and around the world find some sort of a a spiritual, philosophical, moral, existential grounding as well. Um, because then you can see how it becomes easier to develop the world that we all want to see. Whereas if it's just um, lack of spiritual development that's developing the world, it leads to catastrophe more easily. Yeah, this, is, this, is, this, this last portion has been nice diving deeper into the spiritual side of things with you. I, yeah, I, yeah, I enjoy that. If uh, any any time I can engage in these kinds of discussions, it's a real treat for me. It's it's part of what lights me up in my life. Love that. I love that. And then out of the out of the spirituality that you know that you've developed and that you're also ha having with you know with your children that is that is coming forth, that if we are all then from that same origin, if we are all then from that these children of God or these nerve endings of God experiencing itself and creating that is it do you think that our disconnection from that knowledge is the reason why we have so many of the issues I do think that there's a great deal of truth to that uh, I, I believe so I always told my children I taught them to believe in God but I told them if you don't believe in God as you grow up find something that's bigger than you Mm. Because when we don't have something bigger than us in life, then all we have is either money, fame, power, uh, gre uh, greed, um, and, and, and ethics and values go out the door. They do, yeah. They, they disappear. We have to have something bigger than us that we, that we pursue. If something bigger than us is working to alleviate um, hunger among children around the world, great. If something bigger than you is belief in God and that drives you to, to help make the world a better place, great. Um, but we've got to have something that's bigger than us because, um, because that's when life gets really worth living, is when we work for something bigger than us. Yeah, that's so beautifully said that when we have some sort of a meaning, we can find any how to get there behind this why and that we're just doing our, our best to achieve that, then that North Star that transcends us, it transcends our own timelines, it transcends our, 
our own money, greed, corruption, fame, all these things that you listed because we're doing something that's beyond us and that ultimately that it makes, it totally feels like that coming from that single origin and all expressing ourselves, that the more that we're expressing ourselves selflessly um, for the benefit of our families, our communities, for others um, in the world, that it just feels a lot more meaningful. Yeah, so in our company, you know, we're full of uh, programmers and tech types and so forth. And, uh, and so we have, a, we have a, a great work environment and a great culture. I mean, you know, we have a, unlimited vacation policies. We have all of these things that make life easier to work for. But there are a couple of rules that we have. One of the rules that we have is that everybody must engage in time every month in a charitable cause. They must, and they have to report what charity they worked for and what they did. And we organize company events to all go work at times for some sort of charity or days when people can all disperse and we'll let people off for an afternoon or a day and they just go work for something bigger than them, more important than writing another line of code or making one more sales call or raising one yeah. more dollar. Yeah, you would love uh, the last people we just interviewed from Fast Forward, the um, nonprofit tech companies that are uh, do specifically for social impact around the world. So mm. that could be something yeah, interesting to, would, yeah, to funnel. Would love that. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I haven't into. seen uh, that episode. I'll have to go look yeah, into that one. That's yeah, a, that's a that's a great one, and I'm glad you said that. That's a critical policy and community principle at work. Do you think we're in a simulation? I believe we're in reality. I believe that we are real, literal, and physical. Because I have a belief in God and I believe we are God's children, I believe that we are, that it's not a simulation. It's, it's real and it's physical. And then, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? A newborn child, a newborn animal. Birth is, and human beings, mm -hmm. I believe, that's the most beautiful thing in the world. It, it, the most magical thing I've ever experienced is watching my kids be born. Most magical thing I've ever experienced is watching my wife um, birth that child and, and seeing the, the love on her face and the instant love. I, you know, I thought I understood love, you know, yeah. when I had a girlfriend in high school. I thought I understood love uh, when I uh, got married. I thought I understood uh, love when I realized how much my parents had done for me, but none of that compared to when I had a child and the love that increased for my wife and for that child. I mean, that is the most beautiful thing in the world to me. Just hands down, no question. Oh, wow. I love that. And we can almost also be birthed every moment of existence over and over again, especially when you gain new knowledge and it, and it sinks in, that almost feels like you're being born again when you see the world in a new way. And, and like you said also that when a partner gives birth to a child, that the unconditional love that they have for that child, that's another way to understand love, that yeah. first sight that's and so It exists in, uh, in, in many, uh, uh, animal species and so forth. We used to, you know, we had a lot of cattle on the on the ranch, and uh, we would see those born all the time, and uh, and chickens hatched and so forth. I mean, we to see the the nesting and the love and the care. There is there is something bigger than us that yeah. drives that kind of yes. level of spirituality and love. Yes, Paul, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Of course. Talk what a what a pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Keep up the great work. We'll keep working at it. Love it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online on social media about post-quantum IoT security, about our own spiritual development as well, how those two things interplay and all the nuance that we described in the episode, check out agilepq.com, link in the bio below, also Paul's LinkedIn profile. 
and support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders, the organizations around the world that you believe in support simulation. Our links are below. Patreon, cryptocurrency, PayPal, or Design Cool Merchant Get Paid link. Those are all below. And also, thank you, Ori Shapiro, for producing the show. Greatly appreciate it. And build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We greatly appreciate you tuning in. Thank you, and we'll see you soon. Much love. Peace.